Good morning, everyone, um, um, and welcome to uh, to, the, to this session on the investor response during COVID nineteen, uh, new roles and responsibilities. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on this call. Um, of course, I think I can say with all my colleagues here on the panel that, of course, we regret a lot not having you in front of us. Um, meeting annually in Luxembourg to discuss microfinance, I think for all of us is a is an important usual annually annual event and it's nice to see people but um, thanks to the fantastic job <laughs> that the organizers have done we are still able to have this exchange um, so um, the uh, the idea of this panel was to sh to share with you um, this, the specific the reactions of the investors during during the crisis, when when the COVID crisis hit in the beginning of 2020s and the 2020, the business across the world were hit um, by the lockdowns and the and the, uh, the the consequences it had on economic activity. Um, but of course, um, it hit countries in a very different uh, in a very different way. While in the north, uh, the rescue package has helped. To at least smoothen some of the immediate effects, um, it was from the very beginning the the poorest and the most vulnerable populations, which are typically the clients of our microfinance activities, who were most hit. For the investors in the inclusive finance space, um, there was a very difficult uh, balance to be met. Um, of course, the uh, investors had to protect their portfolios. Um, but at the same time, they were confronted um, with the uh, the realization of the mission of protecting exactly those populations that we are working for. Um, what we saw in uh, from very quickly um, in the in, in this crisis um, was a, um, a, a an investor reaction to coordinate the response, um, and in particular with two outstanding initiatives. One that was uh, mainly uh, driven and initiated um, by Triodos and Frank Strappel, who is on, on this panel, um, together with um, a lot within, within COFIN, and unfortunately Noemi, who was very much involved, uh, could not join this panel, but we are very happy to have Donette on the panel with us here today to show the to, to, to share her experience from the investor side. Um, a second initiative had been uh, started. Um, by Grameen Cadet Agricole and Edouard Sears from Grameen Cadet Agricole is also part of this panel. Um, these two initiatives um, did a fantastic work of coordinating the investor response. Um, and uh, the work that has been done by those uh, two initiatives was strongly supported by the SPTF and by the European Microfinance Platform. We created this website, COVID for Inclusion, um, that showed progress um, and shared material that came out of those two uh, the, those two cooperation initiatives, um, and it's that's uh, this is the the page that you see on your screen now, which is the current state of signatories, both of the MOU on the left side and um, of the pledge, and uh, you have the link of this page, and for those who have who don't haven't been there recently, we invite you to check that regularly because it's updated regularly with. With us, with um, with 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 uh, with we are with with the development of further tools and experiences. Um, we I will, the way we would like to structure that session is uh, first of all to 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 uh, recall how it all started. What was the, uh, the rationale of the this, these coordinations? Um, then we would then like to go and uh, discuss some of the short term learnings and observations. Um, and as a, as a third point uh, today, particularly, is to see how these initiatives helped to structure a response in the ongoing, in the longer term of the uh, of the crisis. Uh, so maybe just to, to get started, um, I would like to pass it to my panelists and maybe start with you, Frank, um, with that with this with this first question to say what was the motivation and the rationale behind. Uh, you together with Incofin and some others to, uh, to, uh, to, to get a group of investors together. Okay, uh, well, thanks uh, Jorgen and uh, 
let me say hello, good morning, or uh, afternoon, evening, where, wherever you are. Um, I, well, I, I think first and foremost, it, it's important that when COVID hit the world, um, I think we all realize that this is going to have a big impact on, on our sector. At the same time, we also realized that um, in general, we have a very strong sector that has been robust, that, it, that is, has been built up um, over, over many years. And, and the sector is also very important going forward in, in recovery post, uh, post COVID. So yes, there is a short term uh, need that we all felt, but at the same time, um, also a, a, a very strong confidence in the long-term viability of the sector itself. I think that is a very, very important starting point. Then, of course, we assess the situation and very quickly we could see that with lockdowns and other measures, the whole value chain of financing the sector was, was broken. Very simple, if, if clients cannot repay their loans, the cash flow dries up and it will be very hard for financial institutions to service their debt. So we need more time uh, to, um, to, to, um, yeah, to, to solve that, that issue. Um, I think also very quickly we all realized, and I think this is also based on experiences that we've had in, in the past, that um, it is not an individual financial institution problem. It's not an individual MIV or a finance provider's uh, issue here. It is a sectoral issue. And there are very many parties involved in this sector. Um, and therefore we quickly realized that um, we need more of a sector approach. So yeah, that, that's how we basically um, decided to get together um, with some of the larger MIVs, together covering around 15 billion of financing into the sector to come up with what, what I think now is known as, as the MOU, that actually guides us in how to support our clients in uh, the short-term liquidity uh, needs. And I think the main objective behind that was that, and normally when you do kind of restructuring, it becomes a very intense process. And uh, the whole objective was to keep it as light as possible because the response time needed to be quick. We also decided to be very transparent about that uh, and not just to have an approach among ourselves, but to actually uh, advocate that and publish that to the sector. And I think this is also where, for instance, SPTF has played a, an, an important role to make it visible uh, to the wider community uh, so that everybody could tag along and uh, we could solve this short-term liquidity need issue. Um, yeah. In, in, in a much wider group. And I, th I think we, we, we have seen this uh, being followed up on um, yeah, throughout, throughout the globe. And in, in most cases, by extending terms, agreeing on certain waivers and covenants, uh, adjustments and things like that. Thanks, Frank. Edouard, um, Garminka did I recall, um, also managed together an important group of investors and larger stakeholders of the industry with a slightly different focus. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the rationale for specifically the foundation to reach out uh, to um, a group of investors and agree on a common on a common approach? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Jorgen. Can you hear me well? Very well, thanks. I'm... Yes. Okay, um, good morning everybody uh, and good afternoon. Um, so in March uh, 2020, we, we realized uh, at the foundation, but on, not only of course, uh, that we needed to, to talk with our peers and quickly organize uh, a meeting uh, among CEOs of the organizations so that it's, uh, it was a high level meeting uh, so that we can uh, share our perception of the crisis because we only, each of us only have a one small, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, share of the, uh, of the perception. 
and also uh, to agree how we could best anticipate uh, this crisis. Uh, so we had CEO uh, joining this group, CEOs joining this group from various MIVs and also other initiatives, as you said, uh, Jürgen. So including, for example, networks like uh, Yemen, MFC, Maine, and later on, uh, Ceres, SPTF, uh, AMFA. Uh, and uh, what, what is interesting to note is that uh, in these CEOs participating to this group, we also had some representative of the, the MOU group. Uh, which in fact ensured a, a coherence between the two initiatives, the pledge and, uh, and the MOU. And as for the MOU, uh, the guiding principles of this initiative was transparency, coordination and, and sharing of information so that we have the best information possible to, to anticipate the, the crisis. And in the end, uh, uh, the pledge um, uh, outlined uh, the approach that we wanted to have uh, related to rollovers, to debt restructuring, to hedging issues, re-hedging issues during the crisis, to TA coordination, to common reporting, and last but not least, uh, to, to staff and client protection. And that's one of the, the complementarity of the, of the pledge, uh, is that we, we, we wanted really to put staff and client protection at the center of, of the discussion, because we know from previous crises uh, as you know, in, uh, in countries like Morocco, Bosnia, India, and others, that client protection in particular is always a big part of the, of the let's say, the component uh, of the crisis and how to solve it. Uh, so that was uh, clearly one, uh, one way to, to learn from previous crises. And also uh, what we put into this pledge is a reference to a previous work that was done uh, by uh, Yampi, uh, we, which was the, the Association of International Investors in Microfinance, uh, together with Morgan Stanley. And this paper was about uh, principles for voluntary debt restructuring. Uh, and it was already really building uh, on uh, lessons from the 2008 crisis. So at the end, we, we agreed with all uh, participants that what we said during these calls should be maybe uh, formalized into a pledge. Uh, and so we, we issued this pledge uh, made of principles and we also committed uh, to check later down the, ro the road whether we indeed implemented uh, this pledge and we can discuss this uh, later. Thank you very much, Edouard. I don't know, Frank, if you wanted to add anything in terms of the complementarities um, of the initiatives in terms of outputs, but also in terms of organizations and participants? No, not really. I, I think Edouard put it, uh, uh, ex explained it very well. I think they, they are complementary to each other. Um, in, indeed, the MOU is more, I think, more, more pragmatic. That was also the, the intention. Um, this is a group of parties that realized that we, we have to work together, more specifically in addressing an urgent need that was there at this point in time. The pledge is wider. And I think what Edouard points out, and I think that is a very important thing. In ultimately, um, and there is the risk, of course, that when everybody focuses on risks and rescheduling and things like that, what what happens to the ultimate, um, yeah, what well, client protection and uh, ultimately what what is the impact going to be on the clients that uh, that we all want to service? So I think that recognition that there's a much wider question is very much embraced by by everybody. Also. By the signatories of the MOU, the MOU served a different purpose, and that does, that's why I think they are they are totally complementary. We did not, and the intention was was never to to collect as many signatories to it. the The intention was to be pragmatic and to be very transparent uh, to the sector, and extending an invite to everybody, saying, hey, "This is more or less how we want to approach it. Please join us." And uh, I think that there. It, the, the follow-up that we've seen has been, I think, very good and, and very much appreciated, whether parties have signed up to it or not. Ultimately, uh, it's it's the pragmatic support uh, and, and approach that, uh, that that was important, and I think that that got a, a very strong following. Thanks, Frank. Um, I would still love to stay for one second more with you, Frank and Edouard. Um, um, in the very short term, or in the initial phase out of the experience, what were 
the main challenges that you met by setting up this initiative or your the different initiatives um i think it was not such a challenge i think every participant to the mou itself of course we you, you need to come up with wording and people need to be confident uh, confident with that and that that takes a little bit of time with the 10 parties involved um i think everybody was comfortable with uh, uh, going public uh, with it one party says I, I fully subscribe to it but we cannot sign up to it and, and, and that was okay not a problem uh, because again it, it was not about the signatories it was about behavior that we wanted to stimulate um, I think the challenge is is more um, what's happening uh, to the market later on. So the MOU is not a problem that solves everything. It was a very, I think, quick, pragmatic, and useful approach to address the short-term needs of, of liquidity. And it's still relevant because uh, we see countries coming out of uh, lockdowns, going back into lockdowns, Across the globe, we still see things happening. So it continues to guide us uh, going forward. What, what it does not do is address the longer term issues, because now what we are starting to see uh, more and more is, of course, what is the long term macroeconomic impact going to be on these portfolios? What portion of COVID rescheduled portfolio is going to be translated, transferred into real portfolio at risk? What does it do to uh capitalization and, and things like that um yeah and we'll get to that question afterwards in the longer term in yeah. the longer term run right but maybe also edouard is are there any uh, uh let's say uh, observations from the in initial challenges of connect of collecting of yeah of coordinating uh different types of organizations, yes. in in fact, uh, organizations. i think the challenge was the the quantity the quantity of uh, rollover requests that we had to to face and uh, and for that the pragmatic approach of the MOU was really useful because in fact we already had a kind of pre-agreement of the different MIVs of what the solution should be we had the main direction then we just had to work the details of a handshake agreement and this quantity challenge was uh, i think solved by uh, uh, by the uh, the MOU very pragmatic uh, approach uh, then we had also some uh, uh, some ch challenges related to to the implementation of the pledge, uh, and one of them was to make sure that at each uh, rollover that we decided, we indeed uh, complied uh, with the pledge. Uh, so what we did is that we had a, a detailed Excel file that helped us check principle by principle whether the the rollover decision was in line with, with the pledge. In some cases, we saw that some MFIs that was more in June uh, were decreasing staff quite uh, a lot, but that was really a minority of MFIs. And so we were wondering, okay, we, we pledged that uh, there should not be uh, firing of staff during that period if it's just a liquidity issue. Uh, so what can we do now as just a, a, a debt provider? So uh, what we did is that we shared with the, these MFIs um, uh, the ILO CDC recommended practices on how to use staff during uh, times of crisis. That's available on, on the SPTF website. We had also some issues with uh, re-hedging uh, some loans, uh, a minority of loans, but uh, we had some re-hedging issues. Uh, and in fact, fortunately, after two, three months of crisis, the re-hedging cost was not so high. It was very high at the beginning, but uh, after two, three months, it, it was not, not so high. But in some cases, we had to convert the loan into foreign currency. Uh, and that was acceptable when uh, we had uh, open currency positions, maybe of 6%, which was, uh, which was okay. And finally, the one uh, short-term uh, uh, issue that we had to face or challenge, because we also pledged to it, is to coordinate technical assistance. And so ADA has been uh, the leader on this topic. Uh, and there was a, really a, a, a very important goodwill from different TA providers uh, to uh, to coordinate on this. Uh, and in the end, I think there were several initiatives coordinated, uh, liquidity management webinar, uh, 
that was uh, coordinated between different TA providers. There were client field surveys funded by different uh, uh, funders. Uh, but on that aspect, uh, we believe there is much more to do, and we can discuss this maybe uh, later on. Sorry, I was muted, sorry. Thanks very much, Edouard. I'd love to pass it to Danette now. Um, Incofin has been involved along, I think, with uh, Triodosis, a, a driving <laughs> participant in the, in the MOU initiative, uh, but from directly from a investor practical experience um how did the that coordination help or influence or support uh, incofin's immediate response um to to the crisis and then the discussions that you had um with your with your investee partners yeah so thank you Jürgen, for the question um so indeed as frank was mentioning during uh, times of crisis, um, there's a need to react very rapidly to the evolving situation. So we found that the coordination among the MIVs, which resulted in the MOU, really helped us to um, quickly put out a response. So what we did was um, we used the MOU as the guidelines in adapting our internal procedures on how we deal with um, workouts and restructurings. Um, and for us, um, at the initial onset, we did a survey among our clients and based on their perceptions and their projection at that time from the ground up, we had um, projected that maybe around 25% of our investee base would be falling into a stress situation. Um, and this created a lot of concern for us because our risk department consists of only two people. Um, so we really needed to find a way to be efficient and to manage um, how things were expected to come in. Um, so what we did was we employed kind of the same strategy as the health sector where our goal was to flatten the curve of the number of um, workout cases that would be coming to the risk department or um, as we like to call it the ICU department. So. Um, what we did was we, we used a staging approach um, where we grouped our clients based on four categories that's aligned with the MIU. And um, because the MOU, um, as mentioned, gives kind of a clear course of action for each bucket of, um, of stage that you're at, it gives you an outline of how much coordination you need with the other MIVs, um, the templates you would need to use, um, this helped us to be able to quickly communicate this to our team. It helped our team be able to navigate during a situation where things were changing very quickly, where um, there was a lot of um, uncertainty. So in a way, it reduced some of the confusion in the team as well as how we dealt with our, our investees. So we found it to be um, very useful, very practical on our end. Thanks very much, Danet. Um, I remember at the very beginning of the crisis, one of the you know, big MIVs uh, risk managers told, said, said to me that we have seen crisis situations in the past, um, currency devaluations, uh, environmental crises, etc. What we had never seen was a crisis everywhere happening at the same time. And so I think we, are all, we were also all confronted with a situation that we we never we had never seen before and where we knew right away that it was impossible to manage that on an individual level because it was going on everywhere so uh, that corresponds very much to what you say um now moving on in a more longer perspective i mean we are now six seven months almost almost more into the crisis um what are your observations in the longer term of where you see, and you already mentioned some of those topics uh, in the, uh, what you said before, but where do you see those coordination, uh, those coordination initiatives working or uh, bringing additional either challenges or responses to the longer term uh, development of the crisis? And maybe again, I'll pass it to you, Frank, and uh, we can then go to Edouard and uh, and Daniel. Um, I, I think even today, 
when we when this started, I think our initial expectation was that um, around summer or so we would really start to see the real impact on portfolio qualities, on capitalization, and things like that. Um, we're we're in November now, and I, I have a feeling that it very much differs eh, from location to location, also from uh, from organization to organization. But to a large extent, it's still it's still somewhat foggy out there. We still don't know exactly what uh, uh, the impact will be, um, partly because portfolios uh, have been rescheduled. So as long as it's rescheduled, clients do not have to pay. It's hard to see whether they're able to pay or not eh, because you don't measure, you don't see the arrears. I think one of the challenges initially following uh, on the initial liquidity uh, issue uh, was to get more clarity on definitions. What is a COVID rescheduled portfolio? How do we measure that? How does that relate to provisioning levels and therefore to capitalization, et cetera? Those more harmonization in, in definitions is essential to be able to understand what the real position is and you need to understand the position to look for uh, yeah, the, the best way forward. I think we're in the middle of that process. More and more we get that visibility. What has also helped, and again, I think uh, the participants to the pledge, to the MOU, and again, supported also by, uh, by SPTF, we have done a better job in at least agreeing on definitions so that we have a basis for communication with our, with our clients on that and, and also for ourselves, our investment teams, our investment uh, committees to benchmark the reports that we're getting to the standard that we have, have agreed. So that is providing us more, uh, more clarity. Um, yeah, and, and I think in the next few months, we will, uh, we will uh, start to see that. Maybe one other point, another thing that, that I think throughout the sector, they had, there were concerns about uh, liquidity available. I think what we're seeing today is that uh, lack of liquidity is not so much the issue. Uh, and I'm now specifically looking at, let's say, the MIV level, the funder levels towards uh, towards our clients, towards our um, towards our borrowers, um, and in most cases, also at that that level, liquidity is not. Uh, is, is not so much the issue. So that is that is reassuring. Um, that also shows that there's still a lot of confidence, and I think rightfully so, in this sector. We will start to see some uh, organization in markets that have been harder hit or where, for instance, regulators or governments have not been able to provide support, as some will be more affected than others. And that is something that we will continue to experience. My expectation is throughout uh, 2021 uh, at, at uh, different uh, locations, uh, but it is more concise and I think more manageable. Uh, where, yeah, in those situations, uh, again, coordination is is important. I don't think an, an MOU will solve that because it becomes more individual uh, issues. But I do have a lot of confidence, and that confidence also has increased by the cooperation that we have seen uh, over the last couple of months. That also in in more intense rescheduling uh, or restructurings that, that need to take place. That also is something that requires cooperation and confidence in, in each other. And I think the basis is, uh, is certainly there. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, ultimately, I think we have a very, very robust sector that will not leave without um, some complications here or there. But ultimately, I have a firm belief that if you look at social and economic recoveries in all the countries where we operate, the financial sector probably is even going to be more important uh, in, in supporting that, in financing that. Because if you look at governments uh, that have spent a lot of money in managing the crisis, but it also means that their debt burdens have gone up. Their ability to provide support uh, will uh, diminish. And uh, yeah, I think financial sector, private sectors uh, will play a very important role. And I think we all have a role to play to make sure that, that this sector is robust uh, and supportive in that economic and social recovery. 
Thanks very much, Frank. Before I pass to Edouard, uh, just an invitation for the participants. If you have questions, please uh, don't hesitate. There is a comment or there's a question box for you. Um, uh, we are supported um, uh, by Anis, who will, who will share those questions with you. So if you have any comments or questions or aspects that you want us to go more in depth, please let us know. Um, one observation I have in, with what you already said, Frank, um, what we all, I mean, is that, co that coordination work uh, among other topics that the SPDF was treating, we developed a client interview tool together with 16 decibels and Finca to get client insights. And I think one of the interesting learnings that we had from there, which relates to the liquidity question that you said, is that yet, yes, clients, liquidity was there, but what we didn't see right away is that it was at the expense of reducing savings um, and basically safety cushions that existed. So um, here again, I think the coordination is very important to get the, the right understanding on the impact of the final clients. But I'd love to pass it to Edouard um, in terms of the longer term um, yeah, learnings and the, and the longer term um, value of the, 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 the coordination with the pledge signatories. And I think um, you have done a, a very interesting work also uh, by, by uh, focusing very much on, the, on an evaluation of implementation, um, which I think we all shared. And you said that, Frank, before. It's not about signatories. It's about the practical translation of that, um, of that implementation. And maybe, Edouard, you can share a little bit of that. Yes, I, I, I think I will focus on this uh, pledge implementation over the past six months because it, uh, it paves the way for maybe the next steps uh, for us. Uh, and also Frank uh, outlined also quite well uh, the changes for the future. So I, I will focus on, on this uh, pledge implementation. So uh, during the summer, we worked with a group of uh, pledge signatories to, um, to check whether we were up to our principles. So that includes ADA, Cordet, Frankfurt School, uh, Microfinance Solidar CD, and SPTF. Uh, and so all together, we managed to, uh, to gather uh, 70 cases of rollovers. Uh, and we checked on these 70 cases whether we implemented uh, 10 of the principles of the pledge. In fact, we only focused on 10 principles related to the rollovers uh, because it's too early, in fact, to check whether we uh, we uh, comply with all principles related to the deeper restructuring because we are still at the beginning of, uh, of these uh, stories. Um, and so it was important to us to do this also for us to be transparent about what we, we have done. So I, as it was said a very often already, there was a very good coordination among investors that contributed to no cash uh, crisis. Uh, interestingly, uh, Sometimes uh, among MIVs, we had some, um, some investors that did not want to follow the group approach. Uh, that happens quite rarely, but uh, that happens among, uh, among MIVs. But we have seen that the peer pressure among MIVs has really worked well, uh, meaning that some investment committee decisions that were taken uh, for a fund uh, were sometimes revised after peer pressure to make sure that all the the investors of the same rank had the same took the same level of risk or similar level of risk. Sometimes there can be some practical uh, uh, adaptations, but uh, when it was too too different, the, the peer pressure has been quite effective in our, in our experience. Uh, on technical assistance, uh, as I uh, that's one area where we can improve. We have done a. a already some good steps of coordination, but we feel that there can be much more uh, coordination and future technical assistance. Um, and, uh, and I think it's because, we, in fact, we were so much focused on uh, tackling the most pressing issues of liquidity that we have not spent a lot of time on coordinating technical assistance, but uh, technical assistance to manage this uh, important credit risk, uh, we believe, is one thing that uh, Debt providers that also provide, provide TA can do uh, in a coordinated manner. Um, regarding um, client and staff protection, in fact, um, 
what we have done so far is mostly uh, putting it at the uh, in the discussion of uh, of the different lenders, um, putting it uh, in uh, the handshake agreements. Um, but I think everything remains to be done on that. We still need to use the the information we get from these uh, client surveys, where to, and to really use that uh, that information to to take future decisions. When we will have to decide whether we want to renew rollovers uh, or not, uh, depending on our own constraints, knowing what is happening at the client level and the staff level is an inf information that we need to take into account. And so we have seen that there was some coordination to uh, to define a common reporting tool on the financial aspect. Uh, there is still this need to to agree on what what should be shared uh, in these difficult cases about client and staff protection. And this is still a big uh, a big work uh, ahead of us. Uh, finally, uh, on on the future, I think that we, we do see some. Uh, some dynamism in some regions. Some MFIs are doing quite well. They, are, they need new depth, and uh, investors uh, have provided new depth um, in some regions. Uh, and so we have a role to be able, indeed, to disperse uh, new depth uh, when uh, when it is appropriate. Um, and so on that, uh, we we are committed to uh, to be, you know, here to. Uh, to provide this new depth when possible, given uh, depending on, on our risk appetite. Okay, thanks, Edouard. Um, Danette, maybe uh, from Incofin side also. I mean, where do you see like the yeah the the, the effect of the, the the coordination on the longer term impact? Um, and I think it's um, you can also maybe already comment on one of the questions we got in the in the chat box about um, about the expected future and already ongoing demand for further funding and how you at Incofin uh, mm -hmm. manage those challenges for the investor in a crisis time to continue supporting the sector and and your partners with new fund. Yes. Um, so, I mean, picking up on the topic of what we've we've observed up to this point and what we expect going forward, I think on the positive note, what we're seeing is that we actually have not reached the level of coordination that we've needed or that we were we feared, um, because um, the actual number of cases that needed restructuring has been lower than what we had anticipated. So um, that's been good on on our side. Um, in the cases where there has been severe need for restructuring or workout cases, they tend to be for the cases where the MFIs had um, underlying illnesses even before uh, COVID. So these erupted in the midst of the pandemic. Um, but even in those cases, we what we're seeing is that there's still um, a good recoverability um, on the assets even in those um, severe cases of maybe around 30 to 70% uh, for the lenders. So um, we're still quite positive on that. Um, what we're, look, we're seeing in the numbers, um, of course, as, as Frank was mentioning, I mean, it's still foggy, it's starting to clear up. Um, but what two main concerns that we have is that um, while like during the summer period, we haven't experienced seen new cases of um, or requests for restructuring coming in, which is a good trend. Um, we're basically surviving 2020 thanks to the coordination effort of um, light restructuring and coordinated rollover. Um, but some of these payments are now being ballooned into 2021. Um, and if things start to improve, if the COVID vaccine comes out by mid next year, then we may be on a, a positive trajectory, but if there's a second wave, if things come back into lockdown, there is a concern that um, MFIs may be faced with the challenge of making these repayments next year. Um, at the same time, we are also feeling um, optimistic about it because if you look at the numbers um, on a business as usual situation, 
Um, MFIs could expect around a third of their funding having matured in a year. And through the coordinated efforts, what we would expect in 2021 is probably around 50% of their funding maturing in that year. So it could be a challenge, but it, it's a marginal one if things um, improve in terms of the environment. Um, the other concern that we, we have is that, um, as mentioned, we don't see that liquidity is the main issue anymore going forward. The issue is with the solvency side. Um, looking at our client base, we see that some of them are under provisioning at the moment, um, which raises some concern. Um, I think part of this is because regulators have eased some of their provisioning requirements. Um, and the challenge is we don't know if or when they will be reversing some of these um, regulations. It might happen overnight. It might be communicated and given a sufficient time for the MFIs to deal with, but we, we don't really know yet. So that's something that we need to really keep an eye on. Um, in terms of what in terms of how we will deal with this, in terms of supporting liquidity in the market. I think um, this year we've done a number of coordinated rollovers and light restructuring to support that. Uh, for 2021, I think it's still, it will be a challenge for us because we're still trying to understand where to place new money. Um, we do have liquidity, but what we, we see is that some of the, the financial metrics are still unpredictable. They, they go up and down. When moratoriums end and you see some cases where there's a spike in the restructured amount, there's still uncertainty on, on how that's going to migrate into the PAR. Um, so we, we need to be very cautious. We don't want to be reckless. We don't want to pump um, liquidity in the market when it might not be ready. Um, so in order to be able to kind of screen that, what we've done is that we, we've set out guidelines for our investment team to um, not onboard new clients at the moment unless we've already done an on-site due diligence um, and that the client has a very strong credit worthiness um, will we consider um, onboarding them. Um, we're also doing additional checks at disbursement to make sure that um, the financial situation of the institution at that moment at the new moment of time is improving, that there's no major changes in the country situation. Um, what we're also doing is we've enhanced our social performance checks as well. We're, we have integrated um, COVID related questions to our normal procedures so that the team can make sure that, you know, client safety, staff safety is at the forefront. Um, collection practices are still um, being adhered to. We see in some cases that MFIs are moving towards third party collection agency, which raises a concern for us on whether these agencies have gone through a, a thorough due diligence process themselves. Um, so these are things that we, we are looking at to, to try to make sure that we are still lending in a responsible way and supporting the industry. Okay. Thank you very much, Danette. I had a last, a last question before we look at some of the other questions coming from, from the audience that I wanted to, 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 uh, to, to uh, discuss with you. Um, we are, we're looking a lot at the, uh, the efforts that we request um, the final clients and the MFIs to, uh, to as much as possible continue paying back for MFIs to accept assuming costs by keeping stuff in the organization, even so they cannot continue selling loans, uh, reorienting stuff, basically. Do you have, and I mean, and Dana, you already mentioned one uh, actor or one level of actors outside our investor space, which is the regulator. Um, do you have the impression that the burden of, the, of managing that crisis is shared equally across the chain of actors um, and my question also goes specifically to the in, 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 in involvement or the role that the dfis and also the asset owners and investors into the funds can play and hopefully are playing um, 
What is your observation as at that level? Do you think there is a fair sharing of burden and of of the understanding that we are going through a crisis and there is a moment where we need to adapt some of our short-term expectations? Um, yeah, maybe Frank, I'll let you start. And um, yeah, I, I think that there's there's a few elements uh, to that. If, if I look at, at our funds and basically the the value chain that that we are in, involved in, um, we see, of course, impact on our our borrowers. The impact on us as a fund manager and therefore on the investors in our fund is also there. Um, I think that it mentioned it uh, quite clearly, and that is exactly the same situation for us. Uh, earlier uh, in, in the year, um, we did fear that there would be a bigger problem uh, and, and larger workout cases within within our portfolio. I think partly because of the response that we collectively have had, uh, that is uh, not so much the case. Um, that is very uh, fortunate, of course. Nevertheless, uh, we we do see an effect. We have increased some of our provisioning levels because there were some incidental cases where partly triggered or maybe escalated due to COVID, um, risk has increased. Um, we do both debt and equity. I think there's a difference there. I um, mean, equity valuations. I mean, we are our, our funds are, are are listed. We we revalue them on a at least on a monthly basis. Um, COVID, of course, has an effect on growth rates of, of organizations and in re assessing then the value of, of equity investments. Those equity investments, those uh, valuations have come down. Um, and then there's also the currency effect. Uh, and especially, again, with equity participations, we do have some open positions in, in the funds. Um, and that has an impact as well. So um, throughout the chain, I think everybody felt, felt the hit. Now, I think your, your other question, uh, and I think you're also looking specifically at the role of sort of public versus uh, versus private uh, money. I think that is an issue. I think that is also a challenge going forward. One of the con concerns that, that that we have or uh, that, that we might see um, next year, there's not so much a shortage of, of liquidity, but there is a risk of flight for quality that the liquidity that is available, I mean, of course, everybody's managing their risk. Everybody has liquidity that we would like to deploy. And of course, we want to deploy that with, with the lowest risk. So there's a, there's a risk that everybody starts to service yeah, the, the same parties. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's very important to, to keep that very well balanced. And I do also think that um, this is also an area where um, some of the more public funds have a role to play. Um, do not go there where private money can already service that and, and basically outcrowd that part, but concentrate on a longer term view on sustainability of the sector as a whole. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do think that that is a challenge sometimes because sometimes I do see transactions happening that yeah, I, I'm of the view that, that that could be easily serviced by, by private uh, funding and that, that public money could have been deployed with a, let's say, a higher impact uh, focus. Yeah, yeah, and I, I understand. I mean, there are very different situations of who the investors are, if it's first private investors or if it's public money. And uh, we need to uh, be very clear about the risk capacity of the different actors in in this in this value chain or universe, Eduard, from your side, um, uh, any thoughts on the the burden sharing across the the actor chain? So, uh, as I said, I think so far among MIVs it was quite uh, quite fair, and uh, I agree with what uh, Frank said. Uh, throughout the chain, it's, it's true that we had also an impact uh, on us uh, through provisions in some cases. Um, but I fear that the, the impact was not uh, so much in 2020. It will be more uh, in the coming years. Because thanks to borrowers, we managed to push a little bit the, 
the problem further to flatten the, the curve, uh, which means that uh, for MFIs that are still able to uh, to face a crisis thanks to rollover, I believe that we, we will still have to provide rollovers. And that will be one of the efforts that we will have to do again, is to provide this flexibility. This is probably not, uh, not finished. And then some MFIs uh, are facing uh, really uh, deeper restructuring issues. And so far, as Danet said, uh, what we saw is that the, these MFIs, which had to go through deeper restructuring, were MFIs which had problems before the crisis. But it's possible that next year, it will be also MFIs that didn't have problems before the crisis. And so for these MFIs, uh, we will have to restructure the debt. And uh, in, some in some cases in the past, when we restructure debt, we have to do some important efforts uh, in terms of uh, uh, timing of repayment and sometimes in terms of uh, interest payments. But this comes only in these extreme, uh, extreme cases. And it's a case by case uh, decision. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, the risk appetite, uh, I, I, I think I, I can talk now for the foundation, not, uh, not for really for the, all the signatories. Um, we are a private uh, foundation. Uh, we have a mandate to work with tier two and especially also tier three MFIs. And we do get funding from DFIs to do that, uh, to work with the tier three and tier two MFIs. Uh, and for some of them, we are the only funder or among the only, only funders. Uh, and we are able today, uh, thanks to the funding we get from DFIs, to grant uh, funding to these MFIs, um, which would not have got funding before the crisis with the current power figures that they have. But if we see that they have a good credit risk trend and enough solvency because of the crisis, now we accept to finance them. And that's uh, thanks to also DFI money that we got. Um, but still, in some cases, there are some MFIs that uh, really provide a specific input on the market. Uh, in some specific rural areas, they are the only one. And these MFIs sometimes show a very high level of risk, and we cannot finance them because it's too risky for us, even for us. And in these cases, we do not always see public money here to maybe to subsidize them to, to face the crisis or to provide really patient money. This we do not see. On the, on the fiat. Yeah. Patient money or TA to support and, and help organizations address weaknesses and structure. But we do CTA. We do CTA financed by DFIs. And okay. we coordinate TA financed by DFIs. Um, there was a question in the chat box also that I would like to, uh, to, to, to put to the net from a very practical perspective. I mean, um, the, the crisis came with a lot of restrictions in terms of travel and, uh, and, and capacity to go in, on the ground, uh, evaluate, uh, assess um, our partners. Um, how do you at Incofin manage that new uh, situation uh, for portfolio managers and for your risk management? either for existing partners, but even more challenging, I guess, for new partners, um, where you have to be able to get a, uh, a, qualit a, qualit a qualitative evaluation without being able today to go, uh, to go uh, on the premises. Yeah. So indeed, I think the challenge is more with the new clients that we haven't worked with in the past. Um, we, at the different regional offices, what we are exploring is partnering um, with other MIVs um, in hiring local consultants to support um, on doing the due diligence. Um, it's still something that is being discussed, um, some areas being tested. Um, and so until we can actually do physical on-site visits, um, this could be an option. Um, there would be somewhat of a like a co-financing of these consultants, clear guidelines on the type of things that we would need to assess and then carrying it out some parts of the due diligence via a virtual conference call. Um, 
so um, more to see um, on, on how that will work. Um, and I guess this is something that may need to be put up among the MIB groups as part of a coordination discussion or MIU or, or something along those lines as well. We have five minutes left. I don't see any other questions. If they come in, please do that. If not, maybe um, what I would love to uh, to ask you is um, ideally, if you have, if there's one, uh, if there's one wish that you would have uh, for uh, to 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 make sure that we we are we have a, we have we managed to get a responsible response to this crisis management um is there anything that would that stands out for each of you um as one thing not mi either mi missing or that you would like to see strengthened or still improved and which can also be a, an appeal for the sector organizations like the european microfinance platform or the spdfs or others to to uh, help you provide a responsible response going forward. Can I have two wishes, Jürgen? You can have two wishes, Frank. Of course, <laughs> we're not at your. No, I, I think the first one is a wish that I think everybody has is that uh, that we have good vaccines uh, that that the problem um, to a large extent goes away, and not just that the vaccine comes but it also becomes available to the markets in which we operate. And uh, yeah, that, that I think is, uh, is yet unknown, but that, that would be my, my first wish. My second wish would be that um, we actually can harvest some, some positive things out of this. I, I think the impre increased cooperation that we've had uh, provides for a good basis and a good platform um, to build on going forward. And I would hope that collectively we find a way that we do not fully go back to the old way of working, where often, and uh, I mean, we were also, we are also part of that. Uh, uh, I think an average MFI probably has what, 10, 15, 20 different borrowers. One week Incofin is doing a due diligence, next week we come, uh, and then our colleagues from others uh, come. And I think there's quite a lot of overlap. So I think in the, in the sector itself, there is a lot of, uh, inefficiency that ultimately needs to be paid by by the borrowers, by the end borrowers. Um, and of course, we all have our own mandates, we all have our own profiles and our own way of working. Nevertheless, I think there's a lot of common ground that we all have uh, that we should be working on. Um, be it more standardization on reporting, um, more club deals, more syndicated uh, facilities, I think those would be advantages to the sector that, that could be here to stay. And I think COVID has the opportunity to, uh, yeah, to, to escalate that. that. That would be one of my hopes. Yeah, I, I can only fully subscribe to that. I, I think there's a lot of inefficiencies that we kept on <laughs> in, in, in the world before and that hopefully now become even more obvious. And hopefully that leads to some serious thought. And uh, I mean, that's what networks like SPDF have always been trying to do is, is push this shared learning to create efficiencies that we need. Edouard, maybe I can go to you for your, one, for your wish. Yes, um, well, the, the wish of Frank was, uh, I think, quite, quite good and broad. So I will uh, put my wish into this wish. Um, in fact, uh, we, we see that um, we have managed to coordinate uh, on, uh, with the crisis assessment tool that was promoted, and I think in particular by, uh, by Incofin. Uh, but it was only for the extra information uh, collected for the, to, to monitor the, the COVID crisis. And we do see that it's, it's a real challenge to, to align more than this because each um, investor has developed its own internal systems and it's very complicated to, to align all the systems. Uh, so that's for the financial information, but for the social information and the outcome information, I, I think we are, we are in the right timing. Uh, there is this, uh, all these new surveys coming, coming from uh, uh, these uh, field uh, surveys, um, uh, also where SPTF is, is involved. 
and we can already we can agree together on a common framework and then design our own systems so that it's efficient from the beginning because we do see that when we are not efficient from the beginning it's a big challenge to to revise it so my wish would be to, yeah. to have outcome measurement as uh, to accelerate this initiative and uh, and be able to have a common reporting uh, on this yeah i think it, we we all agree on that that's and that was really an, a very interesting example with the the client interview tool that we did i mean it's thousands of respondents and in, by trying to avoid that everybody comes and asks the same question to the end client, at the end, this is information we can share, and then we can integrate that in our in our processes. Donette, time for your wish. <laughs> um, so, um, in addition to all the wishes that have already been put out, um, I think um, my wish would be uh, it would be also responding to one of the questions on the role of the DFIs. Um, it would be a call for action for DFIs to not move out of the sector, assuming that the sector has already matured. Um, I think the crisis has revealed that there's still an, a lot of subsidized support that the sector could benefit from, um, especially into technical assistance, um, helping institutions um, upgrade their business models to deal with um, these types of events. Um, support and accelerating um, digitalization, new products. Um, so um, on, on my wish would be for continued support from DFIs on that side. Okay, thank you very much. We are we have reached the time, but then we, 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 we got the allowance to, to still have take two, three minutes to answer one interesting question that we got in the chat box, um, uh, which was, did you see evidence of a link between social performance and resilience? Um, I think some, it was already a little bit answered uh, by Edouard uh, when you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the focus on staff and client, but do you have any additional um, observations within your organizations on where you saw that responsibly positioned organizations had a different level of resilience or, or uh, impact of crisis before we close. And anybody, please feel free. Um, I, uh, Frank? Yeah, yeah well, I, I think it is a very wide question that is difficult to answer in, in, in a few minutes. Um, I actually think that the real question I mean, okay, what is now the impact of of all this that it, that is happening on the end clients and is there is there an impact um i think it requires more research and maybe also just more more time to make it visible and uh, maybe one thing to highlight I mean, what we see happening again throughout the chain is a lot of um, moratoria offered to clients is that a good thing or a bad thing who knows because also for for some of them it might solve their, their problems. If their business uh, start to perform later on, they will be save, uh, able to service their debt. However, for some others, it might actually create sort of a, a, a balloon payment that they would have to come up with at, at the later stage. We also have seen those reschedulings uh, priced for in, in different ways. So, I mean, do you only reschedule principal? Um, or do you continue to to uh, to charge interest uh, or, or or not? Uh, do, do you basically waive interest over the over, over the moratorium period? That's an advantage to the client at a cost to the to the lender, of course. I think we have seen I think a few situations, and this is also where we pushed quite hard back on that, where um, loans have been rescheduled, um, and at the same time interest being added to the principal as a result of that the end borrower needs to pay interest over the interest and i think that that's a recipe for um creating a further debt burden on, on their shoulders yeah. so i think also the rescheduling themselves they come in different shapes and forms yeah. Donet or do anything to add on that uh, Um, I think to, to observe uh, how social performance has an impact on the resilience, we need a bit more time. 
But we do see that some uh, MFIs in countries uh, that went through crisis and therefore had to improve their client protection practices are facing the crisis quite well. So I'm, I'm thinking about uh, some of our partners in Bosnia and, uh, and India, where the client protection practices are quite well advanced. And I don't know if it's a chance or, or not, but in practice, they do face the crisis quite well. I believe to think it's uh, it's uh, linked. Then, if anything you want to add, I know I mean Incofin is, uh, is has always been an example in terms of implementing uh, you know social responsibility and um, it be beyond, of course, our I would say our in intuitive feeling. Uh, do you already see evidence or? Uh, or well, I mean, I think. Um, going into the crisis the institutions that already had strong social performance management tend to have stronger relations with their clients stronger loyalty so that um, could play a part in in helping them in the recovery but i would agree with frank that i mean more research needs to be done on what impacts the moratorium will be having on the end clients um, and to see if some of the client protection principles that are in place was strong enough to deal with this kind of crisis um, that needs to be further investigated yeah okay um i'm getting told that we need to come to an end um, um i want for a big big thank you uh frank danette edouard for sharing your insights um I, it's also an opportunity again for i think for uh, me and for us as SPTF to thank you for those initiatives because um, I know that when we at SPTF were thinking of what we need to do to support this industry in the beginning, um, we were able to build on the those those uh, first steps that you had taken to already coordinate and the investor response and so that made it the entire progress much faster and so congratulations for the work you did and thanks for uh for sharing that with the panel um if anybody in the audience has additional questions you know how to reach us we'll be happy to share more information and i can i wish you a, a good continuation of the conference the price later on and uh, and yeah more, more to come in the next two days thank you very much Thank you, Jorgen. And thanks for SPTF for offering a platform uh, to, to make all these initiatives more uh, visible to the whole community. I think that was really important. Yeah. Yes, that's our, that's our mission <laughs> for this industry. <laughs> thanks to you all. Have a